Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church, where we seek to be followers of Jesus who love God in worship, love others in small groups, and who serve the world in mission. Welcome to those of you online as well. Uh, my name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here. Pastor Annalise has gone over to the fellowship hall to kind of play hostess uh, to everybody that's helping to pack meals. You get to do that right after worship today. If you're new here, Please, if you're here in the room, sign out this, fill out this green card, give us some contact information so we get a chance to meet with you later on just to say hello and get to know you a little bit. Welcome to you online. We hope that you'll check in there as well. Uh, but now let us continue in our service of worship as we sing together.
Please be seated as we invite Hannah to read our morning scripture. Today's scripture reading is from Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down in the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come up and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning. How is everybody? Good. Um, what are you going to do Thursday? Do you know? Do you know what Thursday is? You do? Who can tell me? Oh, wait. Wait. Go ahead, Charlie. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Thanksgiving. It's where we give thanks to God for all that God has given to us. How is your, how's your family going to celebrate Thanksgiving? Do you know what you're going to do? You're going to eat? Yeah, what are you going to eat? Maybe turkey. Not everybody eats turkey, but we'll be eating turkey. A lot of people like to eat turkey. He is, the turkey is a very honorable bird. There was one guy named Ben Franklin who wanted this to be our national bird instead of the eagle. But uh, they're also delicious, by the way. So at your dinner, um, who's going to sit at the head of the table? Maybe you remember last Thanksgiving and somebody sat at the end of the table. Who's going to sit at the end of the table? Your dad? Okay. Dad always sits at the head of the table? Yeah. Sometimes maybe moms or granddads or grandmas sit at the head of the table. That's like the most important place, isn't it? So Jesus tells us a story this morning about people gathered for a fancy dinner, and he says, don't take the seat of honor. Don't sit at the head of the table. Because where are you going to sit at Thanksgiving? I know when my family got together, it was, you know, lots of family, grandma, grandpa, everybody we could get. Charlotte, where, where are you going to sit at, the, at Thanksgiving dinner? We're on a bench? Yeah. We used, to call it, we used to call it the kids' table, right? All the adults sat at the big table with all the food, and we got, like, leftovers, and we had to sit at, like, a card table. Maybe it was a table shorter than everybody else. So you, you get to sit at the kids' table, and dads and grandmas, and you know what Jesus said? Everybody at the table is important. Perhaps Jesus thinks the most important people are the ones at the kids' table. He wants you to know that you are important. And he also says, share, you know, share your meals with people who need a good meal, right? We're going to be eating lots and lots of food. Let's remember those folks who have trouble finding a meal, and let's do what we can to feed them as well. And guess what? When you leave, Miss Patty and Miss Jeanette, if you want to go with them instead of staying here with your parents, you get to go with them and help prepare meals for other people. And they're going to explain more about that in a minute. Isn't that wonderful? So, two lessons. You're important, okay? Don't feel bad at the kids' table. People like me once sat at the kids' table. And you are just as important as the people who sit at the head of the adult table, okay? And secondly, share the food that you receive. Remember, we're celebrating Thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for all that God has given to us. And we Christians are also called to share that with others. All right? Let's pray together. God, thank you for all that you give us. Thank you for all the wonderful people that will be at our table this Thursday. We love them. Remind us 
that all of us are just as important in your eyes. And now bless us as we seek to serve others, people who need a meal. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can go with Miss Patty, Miss Jeanette, or you can go back to your folks. So some of you saw the truck out front. Rise Against Hunger uh, brings everything necessary to package like six meals in one plastic bag. All you have to do, if you're in a place of crisis, which is this is who these plate meals are prepared for, if there's been a tornado, if there's been a hurricane, if you're in a place where you can't get food, Rise Against Hunger will have these stocked and they will deliver them to places where there are emergencies. All they have to do is be heated and add water, and it's like a stew. It's wonderful stuff. Um, we're going to be packaging 15,000 meals in the fellowship hall today. It also costs money for all those ingredients for 15,000 meals, all the plastic bags, all the beans, all, everything that goes in there. Um, and we just want to let to remind you, this is one of the things that we can do as a church because of what you do every single Sunday like this Sunday. Because of your offering, the church has said, this is important, we're going to buy all these materials, and then everybody can come and volunteer and package these meals. It's just one of the things that we get to do to show Christ's love because of what you're about to do now. Show your generosity and your love for God through your giving. Will the ushers please come forward?
Amen. Thank you, Ben. Today, uh, we continue our worship series entitled Hope Remains. The idea is that there is enough to give us anxiety these days, so let's focus on, for a few weeks, on the hope that God gives to us in Jesus Christ. Today, we call it, we call the sermon, A Feast for All, looking at who's included around God's table and how that's a glimpse of the hope that is to come, the promise of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. God, this week we are going to celebrate and give you thanks for all that you have given to us. In the midst of a feast, show us some of your lessons. Show us something of your love. Not only that we receive, but also that we are called to share. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen. So it's Thanksgiving week, and guess who's coming to dinner? In terms of the scripture and this morning's metaphor, it's Jesus. We're inviting you to think about Christ and how a feast is a vision of the kingdom that is to come. Think about your own Thanksgiving dinner. Who's going to do all the work? Who's going to do all the preparation? There's lots to get ready for, right? Hopefully, that's not just a one-person job. Who's going to carve the meat, the turkey, the ham, whatever you've got? Who's going to set the table? And will it be a formal setting, you know, with your wedding china that you pull out once a year or whatever? Or does everybody just go to the kitchen and fill their paper plate? Lots of choices to be made. Who gets to sit at the head of the table? Is it the patriarch, the matriarch of the family? Who gets to sit at the kid's table? And one thing that Jesus asks us to consider, though Thanksgiving is usually kind of family and or friends, who's invited? Who's invited? He asks us this morning to rethink our seating arrangements as well as our invitation list today. From the scripture today, you understand the context if you back up to the first verse of chapter 14. And we read these words. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. They've invited Jesus with kind of ulterior motives. They want to watch him. Who is this Jesus who is becoming so popular, who some people are calling the Messiah? They're watching him. How will he comport himself at a formal feast? Is he well-mannered? Is he well-educated? You know, I hear he's from Nazareth, of all places, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He's not even from Jerusalem. I hear he's the son of a carpenter, of all things. And you know what else? I heard something about a questionable birth, right? We wonder about his family. But as they are watching him, Jesus is also observing them. And because Jesus, when he comes into a room or comes into the world in the Gospels, he makes the kingdom of God present by his very presence. And his presence and the idea of the kingdom of God turns something like a feast absolutely upside down. He's at the dinner of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. For those of you that don't know, Pharisees are people who, you know, led your local synagogue. They taught you how you were supposed to live, like, you know, don't work on the Sabbath. Okay, what is work? And, and when does Sabbath begin? And when, when does it end? And the scribes were those who studied the Hebrew scriptures and the oral teaching that helped people understand exactly what that was. So these are religious leaders and Jesus is observing their own behavior as well as they are observing him. Jesus used the setting right in front of them as a living parable. We can imagine who's seated at the head of the table. Probably the leader of the Pharisees after all. He's the host and also he's the most important Pharisee there. People would have, someone else would have seated to his right. Probably his second in command if, if you will, the vice chair of the committee or you know, the one who was going to step in as the new leader whenever the current leader was gone. Maybe it is left as Jesus since he is the invited guest, the guest of honor. And then around the seating area, it's, it wouldn't have been a table with chairs like you and I know. This is an, an ancient meal. They would have been on cushions. They would have been leaning on one elbow. And then they would have been eating the food that was set before them with the other hand. But just like our own tables, there was, you know, Kind of a place guard for everybody. If it wasn't there, it was already assumed and understood. 
The rest of the Pharisees probably would have been around the table according to their importance, and then over at the kids' table would have been those scribes because they're not, you know, full Pharisees. The idea is very much like our own seating arrangements, if you will, in society. Now, in American society, it, it's not like ancient times or medieval times in Europe or even up to the 19th and early 20th century where your family, into what family were you born? Right? From the day you were born, you were given a class. Your family may have had titles if they were in Europe. So there was an understanding of how important you were and how you were to be treated. In, in America, it's a bit different, and yet we still have our own, if you will, striation of society. There's still certain classes, not so much at Thanksgiving meals and, and Christmas parties. Those tend to be, you know, for family and friends. But then you get into social events, charity fundraisers. You only invite those people that might have an inclination and the capacity to contribute to that charity. If you have a business open house, right? A real estate open house or, or a new business that's opening, you invite people that will potentially be able to do business with you. Simply by being invited, you are already known to be a person of some status according to what's going on. Are we doomed to this separation of humanity, this striation of society? Even if we weren't born into class, do we still have those unwritten rules who think that so-and-so is more important than other folks? So Jesus, using this feast as a parable, begins to make a couple of important points. Point one is nobody likes somebody who thinks they, they're more important than they really are, right? Even if they are more important than the rest of the crowd, if they lord it other, over others, you still don't like it, right? They're just kind of rubbing it in your face. There is this gift of humility embodied in Jesus Christ who is God-made flesh and bothers to come and be one of us and sit and eat at a table with other human beings. Humility is a Christian ideal. Let's read what Jesus has to say in verses 8 through 9. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet. Do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, um, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. Imagine if you did that. I mean, now weddings are a bit different. It's kind of who knows the bride and groom the most or whatever. This is a social event and Jesus is at one. And somebody seated here. You can imagine somebody who took the wrong place. Then the host has to say, I'm sorry, you need to get up and go to the end of the line. And you have to walk around the table or the eating area, and everybody's watching. It would be absolutely humiliating, right? No, he says, take the lower place. And think about that for a minute. Why is it that we feel like we have to put ourselves in a place where other people are going to respect us in the first place. It's that we lack a certain level of self-esteem, right? We don't think we're being appreciated as we ought to be appreciated. Why do we worry about having the approval, respect, honor, and love of other people when we already have all of that from the only one that matters? And that's the Almighty God. You hear that? Wherever you think you are being seated at the table, whether you deserve to be, it doesn't matter. You already have the honor, respect, and love of God. Why do we think we need it from any human being? Or as Joseph Fitzmaier says in his commentary on Luke about this passage, Jesus lets it be known that real honor will come not from one's self-seeking choices, but from what is bestowed on by another. Right? We are respected, we are honored, we are loved. Not by the way we think it ought to be. That's determined really by other people. But most of all, it's offered by God. So we don't have to worry about what other people think. Jesus says, in contrast, in verse 10, But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. You're in the lowest place, and all of a sudden the host comes. No, 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 no. 
come sit here. And the whole group watches as you are reseated at a more important place. Sit at the lowest place. There's nothing more beautiful than someone who deserves all the respect and honor in the world, and yet they carry with them a humble spirit, right? I learned this as a child. Back in the day, when I was a child and my father was a pastor, the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church, has always been organized geographically. There's a Virginia annual conference, which covers most of the state of Virginia, and that's subdivided into districts. And those districts, you know, you would have meetings and training and all of that. Back in the day, the families used to get together about once a month for like a fellowship meal. There might be a little bit of business carried on among the clergy, but it was, it was like a fellowship meal. And I was a child. And this one was really informal. But we had a new district superintendent. His name was Dr. George Leitner. So he was kind of the guest of honor, the most important person. He was everybody's boss, by the way. And I'll never forget, there I was, seated at the kids' table with all the other kids. And here came Dr. Leitner, who sat at the kids' table. And he was telling us how much he liked Kool-Aid, just like the rest of us. Friends, that's been 60 years. And I remember that to this day. Somebody that was supposed to be the most important person in the room, who by his very presence sat with those that everybody else just pushed off to the kids' table. They're not as important. And he said, you're just, um, just as important as everybody else, if not the most important people here. Right? There's nothing more beautiful than someone who embodies humility and says by that example, everybody here is important. That's why Jesus finishes with this little motto in verse 11, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those, who people, those people who say, oh, I'm the greatest, oh, look at me, one day they're going to get theirs, Jesus says. They will be humbled. We'll find out the truth about them, because none of us are perfect, are we? And everybody who feels lowly and ignored, those are the ones that Jesus Christ is going to lift up. Think about it this way. You're gathered for Thanksgiving dinner, and Jesus is actually coming. Where do you think Jesus is going to sit? You think he put himself at the head of the table? No. He never did. Right? He wasn't born as a king. He didn't hang around the high and mighty. He hung around people who needed him. So I'm imagining if Jesus Christ comes to my Thanksgiving dinner, he's going to sit with that member of the family who needs his love the most. You know, big gathering and maybe somebody at the table's lost his or her job. Haven't told my parents yet that I'm out of work. You know, that awkward type of, you know, that's probably the person Jesus is going to sit next to. Or that awkward teenager who the rest of the family doesn't know but suffers from depression. That's probably the person Jesus is going, you, you can fill in the blank yourself for your own Thanksgiving dinner. That awkward relative that's probably the one Jesus is going to plant himself next to. The second point that Jesus makes very loudly and clearly is real love never expects to be repaid. Okay? True love, true giving never expects anything in return. Listen to what he says in verses 12 through 14. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You know, one of our most awkward human experiences is when somebody gives us a gift and catches us by surprise because we think, oh my gosh, I didn't get you anything. We know with our heads, true love is expressed by giving, not expecting anything in return. But our gut says that love is transactional. We might even catch ourselves, you know, giving something to someone else or, or sending them a Christmas card or a Christmas letter. You know, you know what? I haven't gotten a letter from them in several years. We're, we're taking them off the list. If you really, for a little extra credit and, and for a good laugh, Google Saturday Night Live, The Christmas Candle. They did a little skit about, you know, you get that candle and you're not sure what to do with it. You stick it in the closet or in somebody's purse. And then, in that awkward moment, 
when somebody says, here, I got you something, you can go into your stash and say, oh, here, I got you something too. It's the gift of having something to give away. Um, it's just funny because it gets to our human nature. We think when somebody gives us something, we, we have to give something in return. So Jesus says, when you invite people to your feast, don't invite people that can repay you or that you might even expect them to repay you in some fashion. No, do it for those who just need a meal. People who will never repay you. This is a metaphor that Jesus is using for the way we treat other people. Do things for other people just because you can, just because you love them. He uses the parable of the feast, and I'm saying this morning also, I'm just going to suggest, you might try this literally, and you will learn something new about yourself and about other folks. I was in a uh, disciple Bible study class. For those of you that don't know, disciple Bible study is a type of Bible study the United Methodist Church produced years ago, and it's intense. You study the Bible, you read it for like a half an hour every day, six days a week for 34 weeks, and then there's a two-hour study session. We were in Disciple 2. We looked at Genesis, Exodus, Luke, and Acts, and when we got to this passage in Luke, the study guide said, what would it mean for you to take this passage seriously? And we started talking about it. And somebody just said it. Maybe we need to start feeding people that aren't a part of our church, that aren't a part of our social circle. And we kicked it around logistically. Well, you know what? If we invited everybody in the community except for church members, our church members might get the wrong idea, <laughs> like we're trying to send some kind of message. So we decided to just go to a different place and feed people that we'd, we'd never fed before. We went into downtown Richmond. This was a, a rural church, so it was about 30 miles into Richmond. We participated in the Sunday uh, Stewart Circle feeding program in downtown Richmond. Stewart Circle is at one end of Monument Avenue where Jeb Stewart's uh, statue used to be. And then on that corner, three of the four buildings were churches. And those churches started feeding people on Sundays because all the social programs downtown didn't operate on Sunday. So they said, oh, here's a hole we can fill. So we went down there with our motley crew from out in the country and we just joined in. My job was to put together peanut butter sandwiches, put them in a brown paper bag and hand them to people as they left lunch so they would have another meal at the end of the day. And let me tell you, my eyes were opened. It was the first feeding ministry I'd participated in and all of a sudden I'm relating to people that are just in a different world, you know, living on the street. I don't know what that's like. And to encounter people that do that on a daily basis and obviously meeting some people with some psych issues meeting some people who just have something else going on in their life and my eyes were open I learned something and it was done expecting nothing in return I also got to see my world a little bit as God sees it that everybody's just as important and that maybe what we ought to be doing is just feeding people and I know this week, you'll see it in the Winchester Star after the Thanksgiving meal is hosted at First Presbyterian Church. Some of that meal will be prepared here at Braddock Street, by the way. And I know some of our folks will volunteer and somebody will read that and say, yeah, but what do these folks do for the rest of the year? And guess what? First Presbyterian feeds every single Saturday morning throughout the year. Braddock Street, United Methodist Church, you do it every single Monday night. And in a little bit, right after worship, if you'd like... Go on over to the fellowship hall and help to pack 15,000 meals for people who will wake up to a tornado or a hurricane or some kind of famine. And because of God's love expressed through you, they'll get to eat. Where's the hope in this world? The hope is found in the way God loves and the power with which God loves, even through ordinary people like you and me. You see, the vision is like a feast. For there's no real seating arrangement. Everybody's just as important. Perhaps even more than everybody else, those folks who need love. And you get to express that in the name of Jesus Christ. You are part of the hope that this world has because of God's power in you. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you this week especially for all your abundance for us. Thank you for the love of those people that will gather around our tables. 
thank you most of all for your love and the way you love, humbly, in a way where everyone is loved, in a way where everyone will one day be fed. Thank you for that vision of hope for a future that you make real. God, as we gather this day, we pray for our neighbors and our families. We pray for our neighbors throughout the world. We say a special prayer for peace in Ukraine and in the Middle East. God, protect the innocent. And we offer all of these prayers in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand as we are able and sing together, Your Grace is Enough.
thank you for joining us for worship here in this room and also online. Uh, a couple things as you go. Of course, you're invited immediately afterwards to go over to our fellowship hall and begin to pack meals. This is for children of all ages, uh, and there's no training involved. Um, I was a newbie at it once myself. It's very easy. And then secondly, the giving tree is still up in the gathering space on your right as you leave. We're preparing gifts for people in nursing homes as well as children in need in our community. Uh, Ann Bittner left early, but she asked me to tell you some of us are looking for children to buy gifts for. That's where your heart is. That's great. Because of your generosity, we already filled all those, and she went out and got 50 more names from Bright Futures to allow you to be even more generous. God's grace is enough for you, for me, for this community. Go to serve him humbly and just be showered with his love. Go with the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.